Welcome to Podcast Before Me, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Clint Eastwood, where we watch every film directed by and or starring American filmmaker Clint Eastwood and explore how they speak to their moment and this one. The show is hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Jake Serwin. And I'm Ian Ryan. I'm so stupid and I go to the bathroom <laughs> on the floor. We did a little bit where uh, we switched who we were. For I didn't realize for... I was going to be betrayed <laughs> yeah. mid bit. That's cool. That's uh, for our guest uh, uh, information. We we did a little changeling, um, mm-hmm. which of course uh, is the thing that the most evil people in the world do in this film, and we we copied them. How you doing, Ian? Of course, our parents would have. Next to no feelings about our being switched would not affect their lives materially. I have so many materially. jokes about you being switched. <laughs> okay. We're gonna, we have to get to them. Uh, how are you doing, I said? Uh, sorry, sir. I'm doing fine. How was your big vacation? It was great. I went on a big vacation. I don't want to get into it too much because it's, um, you know, it was great for me. It would be boring for anybody else. I went to Venice, Italy, Yep. which is a... Uh, you know, there's a there's a water park next to Knott's Berry Farm here in <laughs> Southern California called Soak City, <laughs> and I feel like Venice has a case mm, against uh, yeah. this water park. Wet, uh, lovely, lovely place. I took the boat over to Lido uh, to see the big, gleaming white building where they do the Venice Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Nobody was there. No red carpet. Uh, mm-hmm. No Lucretia Martel giving the Golden Lion to Joker. Um, but I had some, uh, some great European candy and, um, took a photo. So had a great time. Thank you for asking. That's uh travel corner. Let's bring our guest into this because I have, I have lots to ask him about. I, and I have a bit to confront him about, to hold him to account for. Oh no. Interesting. I'm looking forward to it. Our guest today is a film critic for, among other publications, New York Magazine, Vulture, uh, has worked has appeared in the Village Voice, the New York Times, the Rolling Stone, the Rolling Stone magazine, <laughs> and the Criterion Collection. And from recent Instagram posts, it seems fair to call him Michael Mann's best friend. <laughs> yep. Welcome to the show, Bilga Abiri. Welcome, Bilga. Hello, it's Welcome, good to be Bilga. here. I, I was just in Venice as well. Um, I was at the film festival, oh. um, so I didn't get to see it. <laughs> I empty, um, which must be a real trip. It's so bright. The 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 Adriatic sun is just. Mm. beating down on this all this white marble and and stucco or whatever and it's it's almost uh difficult to be there i imagine it's it's like that with the the red carpet and the flash bulbs as as well but nearly painful it's weird it's so it's it's so crowded that you don't really have a chance to observe yeah. any marble or or any you know architectural whiteness <laughs> You mm-hmm. observe all sorts mm-hmm. of other whiteness, but not architectural. <laughs> <laughs> What's really weird about the so so it's it, it's on this big island that's not it's it's separate from the main the Venice part of Venice that you're thinking of um, from for example such films as The Tourist, which I fell asleep to on the plane. The and it, so it's on the separate island called Lido, which is unlike Venice. Uh, open to vehicle traffic and I didn't really realize until I got over there like oh I haven't seen a car or heard a car in like three days it's been incredible yep. and then you get to the place where they have the cars and you're like oh, this sucks like this it's not how ironic good. that it's it's like the random island that has the cars you know That's and not true. like yeah. the big city yeah. the big city you, you can't drive uh-huh. it you, you can you only can take boats there, I'm, it's literally like the, the streets the, 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 the what they call streets are they're smaller than the the margin of precision on Google Maps. So, like, your phone literally can't tell you if you're on this this street or the one ne- wow. like next to it. Mm-hmm. I assume because of like military restrictions on like civilian uh, GPS technology uh-huh. or something. Uh, very strange place, barely related to this film. But anyway, and, and I also I've been to the festival twice. I stayed on the Lido once in the Venice proper. I never saw an actual. Ferry, like I saw boats, obviously boats everywhere, but I never mm. saw like a car ferry. So the thing I always wonder is like, how did those cars get to the Lido, are and they, did they ever are get they off? Building them over there. Uh-huh. My understanding yeah. is that the the Lido has two ferries a okay. day, and but then there's another island that I don't remember the name of that they call like the breadbasket of Venice or whatever, where they grow a lot of produce. And I, th- I believe that the, the car ferry to that one comes twice a year. Wow. So you have to like wow. decide 
uh, I'm, I need a truck for six months or whatever. It's a commitment. Exactly. And then, of course, uh, every time I see a movie with a fairy in it, that's my new thing of what fairies are. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so for a while, fairies were the thing from The Ring where the horse jumps off. And okay. then for a while, fairies were the thing from Five Easy Pieces. Okay. And now, as of a few days ago, fairies are the thing from The Killer. David Fincher's The Killer. Mm, features, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen the film yet. Uh, it's got a fairy in it. It's a big, okay. big spoiler. And uh, speaking of uh, experiencing the whole world through cinema and uh, basically having no other personality, we got to ask our two questions. We got to get into That's our, right. yep. our famous segment. Uh, Bilgo, were you able to come up with a question? I came up with one. Um, one is perfect. Great. It's not a particularly good one. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, that's great. No, that's in keeping with the pattern. It's not a particularly playful one. Don't worry, it's not a serious one. Um, okay. But I guess, my and it's also possible that you've answered this question, for all I know, many times, but... We, we won't remember. We're both uh, pretty <laughs> sick guys. So if fine. you could recast any Clint Eastwood starring Ooh. movie with any other actor from film history, what mm. movie would it be and who would it be? Ooh, this is very exciting. Hmm. The, the one that jumps out both for recency's sake and just general sort of him reasons is Ryan Phillippe in Flags of Our Fathers. Although he kind of, it's such an ensemble that he sort of fades into the, the mix and it, he's not awful. The character doesn't have a ton to do anyway. It's just the whole time you're like, I'm looking at this guy. I, I should clarify. I, I mean, a Clint Eastwood starring movie. Oh, so, so, so basically okay, you're okay. recasting Clint. Okay, I like this. You well, beat me to recasting Breezy with uh, an adult woman. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, there's no question that there are some Clint Eastwood movies right. that are hor horrifically miscast. <laughs> it's too easy a so question, it's, otherwise. It's yeah. like Kay Lenz and Ingrid Bergman or something? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yep. That's Because that might be kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Let's see. Let me think. What is he really wrong for? I mean, I would have liked to see, I would like to have seen the version of A Star is, well, this is not a Clint Eastwood movie. I wanted to see His Star is Born when I thought it was going to be him and Beyonce. Mm -hmm. I want to see Clint yeah. Eastwood, shut up. I want to see Clint Eastwood and Beyonce interacting so mm. badly. I understand that it was probably not going to be him. I think I was reading today, I think it was uh, at one point they were talking about Tom Cruise playing a thinly veiled uh, Kurt Cobain who never died uh, okay. and Beyonce. Fascinating. So having not answered the question still, <laughs> um, I don't know, Ian, what do you got? I'm stumped. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly just seeking out films that I think are so imperfect to start with that maybe just switching it up will work some magic on it. So I was trying to recast yeah. uh, Heartbreak Ridge with, I don't know, like scoot mcnary or something who do we okay. put in there yeah, like an just... infant scoot mcnary <laughs> yeah. i guess yeah. he probably he was probably like a child yeah. he was a child yeah yep. yeah it might be it might be interesting to see uh, a perfect world with the costner and clint characters flipped can i do Ooh. what was that there was that frankenstein production with like johnny lee miller and benedict cumberbatch where every show <laughs> they they swapped uh, who yeah. was the monster and who mm. was the doctor? There's a famous Waiting for Godot production with Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen. They did the same thing. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, shout out to those guys. Mm -hmm. They're so cute. They are. Yeah. So, you're, so are they swapped and also age swapped? Is this like a fantasy world or? No, I'm going. I'm going with theater rules where okay. um, it does that. You know, like uh, Olivier playing Hamlet at fifty or whatever. Yeah. Great. What about you, Bilga? Do you have a? Do you have a? A dinger of a an answer in mind. <laughs> I don't have a dinger, um, but the one I was thinking of when I was when I was thinking of the question was. Um, I mean, I think in so many ways, Clint Eastwood is is perfect for a cry macho. Although it's like you mm. sort of have to project a, a version of Clint Eastwood that's like twenty years younger, um, right? But but I was thinking like Henry Fonda in Cry Macho. Oh, you know, yeah, okay. That's good. I didn't realize uh, we could time travel. Now I'm yeah, um, yeah. Change it all. Up. Any actor from history. I want to yeah. see. I want to see Edward G. Robinson as Dirty Harry. That's what I want. I want. Uh, mm. No, I want. You know what I want is that's uh, insane. 
<laughs> I want, um, well, I'm just trying to think of something terrible. <laughs> okay. John Houston in White Hunter Blackheart. <laughs> that would be, you know what? That would be kind of good. Although I've also, I, it would be fun to see uh, Daniel Day Lewis just literally doing his, because his his Daniel Plainview is basically a John Houston impression. Yeah, so it would be sure. cool to see just a better impressionist doing it. Although we we stick up for the the John Wilson performance on this podcast. We're okay. uh, mm -hmm. uh, White Hunter Blackheart apologists. I think that's oh, a, it's a very good movie. It needs yeah. a Blu-ray release, first of all. Let's get on this. Well, thank you for the question. Thank you so Ian, much. did you have... I think it's your turn for this. For the... Yeah, I do have a question. We referenced it a little bit earlier. Uh, I would like to know what modern convenience or luxury you guys would trade to have a functional public transportation system in your town. Of course, I'm thinking Ooh, about the, uh, the red car, trolley. The beautiful, exactly, beautiful the red, red car, car, the trolleys in our film. Yeah. I mean, I live in Los Angeles and I miss the red car all the time. My, my uh -huh. grandfather lived here during the time of the red car and we'll talk about hopping on it uh, for downtown to go to the beach in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Makes you want yeah. to throw up. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, Bill, you've, you've recently relocated from New York City to Connecticut. Is that right? Yeah, I've, I've, I've relocated from New York City to the wilds of Connecticut. And mm. as someone who doesn't drive, <laughs> Ooh, I, I have given up a modern convenience uh, for yeah. a public transportation, for a working public transportation system for mm -hmm. much of my life. And now I'm like, oh crap, what do I do? Um, yeah. Uh, so are you on the, the, one of those famous girl on the train trains? Are you on the end of one Metro of the, you North. know, like a, the Mad I'm, Men? Uh, I'm on the Metro North, but like I have okay. to get to the Metro North. I mean, yeah. I, I'm still going oh, okay. to New York and stuff. I mean, I still actually still have my house in New York, uh, but but in a couple of weeks I will no longer have it. Um, mm. But um, but yeah, so I'm going to be uh, you know heavily reliant on the train and also on the train functioning. Uh, so properly. if you give up one mod con, you uh -huh. get basically. Like an even better version of the New York subway. Correct. Convenient yes. to your current place to live. Yep. This is my offer. Okay. This is my devil's offer. Man, I mean, probably like my, uh, probably cell phones. Yeah. I could do that. I was thinking the I same thing. Pay yeah, phones, <laughs> throw some pay phones in there. Particularly if, if you yeah, have car? the other functionality of a smartphone, like I could still search the internet and read books and I just have to go to a, a cafe a to make a call yeah that's fine or like those um in the have you bill have you seen michael bay's the island i'm sure oh yeah mm -hmm. do you remember in the island how it's said in like 2017 la <laughs> and there are little msn branded like computer <laughs> stalls on the street like phone booths they're like search booths yeah. can i do you know what can i just have the exact minus the organ harvesting can i have the uh -huh. exact future <laughs> Downtown LA from Michael Bay's The Island. Sure. Yep. Okay. You can have it. Thank you Seriously. so much. Mm -hmm. Really generous of you. Um, what about you, Ian? Uh, well, you, you stole phones, so I'm going to say sneaker shoes. I'll go back to old bad shoes. shoes. Yeah. You mean like a like a like an Oxford shoe yep. or something? Or yep. like okay. I'll wear uncomfortable shoes all the time wow. if I can uh, just wow. have a subway, some buses. Uh, trolley, whatever. I'm going to clown on Ian a little bit and say that I thought he was going to give up ugly shoes, <laughs> one of his favorite modern conveniences uh -huh. he likes to wear. I did once text Jake a number of options of shoes asking for his opinion. I believe he did just tell me none of these, if that's possible. <laughs> did I, didn't I, I mean, I must have sent you like a, like an alternative. Uh huh. I think he probably did. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to complicate things too much. And now yeah. you're a boots man. Yeah, you you work on the farm. That's right. I'm a work. Boots Ian works man. on farms. Bill, go oh, for your cool. education. Yep. He lives in Oaxaca, Mexico. That's and he's right. showing oh, us all up by doing sustainable agriculture. It's also right. Thank you. No, that, however, <laughs> wouldn't it be a wouldn't it be kind of a pyrrhic victory though to to have a working public transportation system, but then have to give up like foot comfort because yeah. you'll probably be that's walking. That's how brave like, I'm I am. A, I'm a big yeah. walker that's, okay. and, and, and yeah. comfortable Me shoes too. are kind of... Also, also love to walk. Yeah. What about those those awful, the Vibram five-finger toe <sighs> shoes? Do those count as sneakers? <laughs> Do those still exist in this in this world? I don't know. I've never put one on out of my this sense of personal shame that I retain. Those are the things that look like 
feet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yep. they okay. have the little toes in them. Yeah, I see people that, running that, in those. It's horrible, it feels like horrible. those would be like um, you're chasing like them, underwear. Like you can't try them on. Like you just have uh, to buy them and yeah. and wear them. What about you, Bill? Good. You gotta. What are you giving up? Well, I mean, I, I, I said it. I I, I already kind of gave up cars. I mean, I, I still ride in them. I guess so. Maybe that's sure. not. But yeah, I give up there phones you go. too. I would love I to give up phones, my car. Cars. And, I mean, yeah. like these are all things we didn't have. I mean, not cars. Like, we've had cars for a while, but um, mm-hmm. like phones, we didn't have them. You know, or cell phones, we didn't have. You know, thirty years ago or forty Everyone years ago. Everyone was whatever. fine. Yeah, it was fine. It was actually not that bad. It was pretty good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. This film really makes the case that, honestly, things are exactly as bad as they were in many ways yeah. back when there was uh, some stuff that was also good. So, like, we can be kind of, we found a new way to be, like, return guys, <laughs> return guys, but <laughs> not actually, we're not returning to, to uh, like, retrograde, a retrograde value system. We're returning to the same value system, but with, like, public infrastructure. Yep. And I'm very excited for it. The film we're discussing today is, of course, Changeling, uh, Clint Eastwood's first of two 2008 films. This this film comes out October 24th, 2008. It's uh, a little less than two months prior to Gran Torino. He's uh, he's heading into the awards season in 2008, loaded for bear, as mm-hmm. they say. I had never seen this film before. Ian, had you seen this? I had not seen this film. No. Oh, wow. And Bilga, of course, you had seen it because you uh, suggested it. Uh, it was one of the, when we were t- chatting about you coming on, this was one of the ones that you, you said you stick up for. Oh, yeah. What, what's your relationship to this movie and, and to Clint Eastwood in general? Oh, wow. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I guess that's a question I should have big, anticipated. <laughs> big question. That's all right. Uh, no. Um, well, so my, well, my relationship to Clint Eastwood, I mean, I started watching Clint Eastwood movies uh, at a very young age. Um, I, I grew up in Turkey until I was seven years old, but, um, and, you know, my, my parents have been film buffs or are film buffs, but one of my earliest memories is the LP of uh, Fistful of Dollars and For a Few Dollars Ooh, More. Yeah. The classic mm. LP with like Clint's face, you know, yeah, big on the cover. Um, and I would listen to that just endlessly over and over and over again, even before I saw the films. I, I think I saw Fistful of Dollars. I saw after we'd moved to the U.S. It was on TV. My dad recorded it uh, onto a, a videotape. This was pre-VHS, so it was a Betamax. Wow. And uh, and I remember just coming home from school every day uh eating ice cream and watching a fistful of dollars and in fact we it was a late night recording so we had recorded it he'd paused out the commercials if i remember correctly but then he had kept it running what a man and 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 the movie that played afterwards what was also on the tape and that Mm. movie was the charles bronson movie the mechanic Mm. Ooh, okay which is funny because I only have vague memories of the mechanic, but I think I probably must have seen it almost as many times as a fistful of dollars. Fistful of dollars is just like burnt into my brain. Um, And then for a few dollars more, good, the bad. I mean, those, you know, obviously, I mean, I I think that's kind of, those are the gateway drugs to Clint fandom, but I became obsessed with Clint from an early age as a, as a star. And this was, you know, this was the early eighties. So I knew he had become a director as well. And I remember this was the early days of HBO. We didn't get HBO, but a friend of mine down the street had HBO. Nice. Back when it was still called Home Box Office. Mm. Um, and they, they used to show Outlaw Josie Wales a lot. So I was introduced to Outlaw Josie Wales. And then, um, you know, Hang 'em High, High Plains Drifter, you know, start with kind of the Westerns, the non Leone Westerns. And eventually, you know, just sort of just became fluent in Clint. <laughs> um, <laughs> And it's it's interesting because it's like he my fascination with him developed as I got older, but it also coincided with him becoming a more respected director. Right. right. So like yeah. I was in college. Um, Unforgiven is 91, 92? 92. 92. Yeah, yeah, 92. So I was like it was it was a summer movie, right? Is it a summer movie? It was. Yeah, it was like yeah. a big summer release. So it was summer between funny. my uh, my freshman and sophomore year uh, of college. So. And obviously, he directed lots of films before then. And later on, I sort of gained an appreciation for the other films he directed before then. But Unforgiven, 
for so many people was kind of the moment when he sort of became accepted as a, as a great director, obviously. Um, and then after that, Clint Eastwood was, you know, wasn't just an iconic actor, but also an auteur. Um, so right. you sort of had to pay attention to him in, in that way as well. And it was interesting because it's like you, you keep, you know, Unforgiven sort of marked all, sort of the end of one stage of his career and the beginning of another. And at the time, I didn't know if it would continue because you're like, OK, well, he makes Unforgiven and Unforgiven is such a special film and a unique film. You don't think to yourself, well, you know, well, the next movie he makes is going to be just, you know, like, and then he makes and then he makes a perfect world, which, yeah. which did, wasn't as well liked. But I love that film. Right. Oh, that movie's, um, yeah, incredible. incredible. And even farther away from his previous films than Unforgiven is. Right. I mean, oh, yeah, it yeah, feels yeah, like. Absolutely. I think you have uh, mentioned this in some of your articles about Clint Eastwood, which all listeners should check out, but also still listen to the show. Please don't <laughs> nah, go turn away. off the podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about how, of course, Unforgiven represents a revisionist Western, but also maybe forces a reconsideration of some of his, like, you know, you referenced uh, High Plains Drifter, mm -hmm. already kind of revisionist, you know, maybe not to the same extreme. But A Perfect World is, is like a different animal, a totally different type of movie. At the same time, like doing this podcast, you start to connect all of the the red threads of madness and you see that mm -hmm. a perfect world is sort of anticipated by Honky Tonk Man. Mm, and this film recalls both of those because they're the movies where it's the, the Clint films that have a, a boy in them and uh, two thirds of them are set in the 30s or the late 20s. And yeah, I mean, the. At once, it's obvious that post Unforgiven, there's like a, a shift. I mean, he starts working with movie stars, for one thing. Like before yeah, that, man. it's almost always like carefully chosen guys who are not as famous as him. And primates. <laughs> yeah, and yes. primates. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful primates. Mm -hmm. But then after that, you know, it, it, there's a, certainly like a level of, of uh, I don't know, quality control or or production value that, that mm -hmm. increases. But it does seem like he's kind of been working on all this stuff the whole time and like we we talk about how from the very beginning i guess rawhide is is not revisionist or not like commenting on anything prior cuz there's nothing prior except like revenge of the creature from the black lagoon or whatever <laughs> but starting even with the the leone movies like the whole clint project is about the clint project and like recontextualizing the man's image like basically since the moment that he has one which i think mm -hmm. is is one of the most fascinating things about him but i interrupted you sorry you were at uh i think we were at 1993 so mm -hmm. what comes next well there's bridges of madison county um yep. obviously which is which is wonderful but in between there's also he doesn't direct this but but in the line of fire uh oh. which is one of my absolute favorite yeah. films of all time yeah mm -hmm. uh it's i mean so good. that run we love it you know unforgiven in the line of fire right perfect world Bridges of Madison County. I mean, this, this right. is an incredible run there. Um, and here he's, we've got Malkovich back in the fold. I know, mm -hmm. right? That's the yeah. other thing. I, I sort of for, had forgotten about the Malkovich connection until I rewatched this. And, uh, you know, we see this very sensitive side of him. I mean, it's it's always been there. But, but in these films, he allows it to kind of come to the fore in a way that he maybe didn't before, perhaps because he was protecting some aspect of his own iconography. The thing you say about how, you know, I mean, <laughs> his whole career has been about recontextualizing his image right from the get go. That's fascinating because I think, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. But some of that comes from Leone and the filmmakers who were making this, the spaghetti westerns, many of whom were sort of these extremely left wing, you know, Italian filmmakers who right. really wanted to kind of undermine and exploit the western at the same time. So it's like Clint just steps right into the iconography and adopts it without mm -hmm. ever, I mean, obviously there's rawhide, but like, you know, it's almost like the entire history of the Western just comes with him and he just comes to represent yeah. it right from his very first movie yep. um, mm -hmm. or right from his very first, you know, starring role, which is, which is, which is fascinating because it's, yeah. and as you watch the films and I mean, I think you see it in Cry Macho. It's like, it's so much more than him. Like it's so much more than Clint Eastwood. You know, it's like the hundred years, or not hundred years, but like the the eighty years of westerns that came before him. You know, right? When he's in those movies, especially, he is almost purely 
an image. He barely yeah. speaks. And that's, you know, the joke for so long is that he, he makes a joke about it himself. He, I think he's presenting at the Oscars or something and says something about uh, how funny it is that he's presenting an acting award when he hasn't said more than 12 words in <laughs> three movies or whatever. Yeah, he's... Uh, somebody should really do a podcast about this wow, guy. He's yeah. fascinating. And then... Do you recall, because I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to drag up, uh, I don't want to pull receipts on you. I'm about so, to, so it's fine. Good. On the, the, your famous Clint Eastwood mathematics article oh, no. from like oh, 10 no. years ago. This is what I want to ask about as well. Okay. Look, yeah. I love a good troll as much as the next guy. I'm right. not a, not an enemy of comedy, but sure. I have some questions, well, but Jake, please. Arguable sure. that he's an enemy of comedy. <laughs> That's a good point. So. Bill, you wrote this. You wrote this article for Vulture. Can we conduct uh, it like a deposition? You wrote this article, true or false? <laughs> I, I, I wrote this article. I know which mm. article you're talking about. Permission to treat the witness as hostile. <laughs> have, you, have you have you ever seen the article I wrote in response to that article? I, yes, yes, from your yes. blog. Right, good, good, a yeah. lovely okay. article. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, October twenty first, twenty ten. Almost two years to the day after this film comes out. Vulture's Math-Based Guide to Clint Eastwood Movies by yes. Bilga Abiri. In this, you sort of present a, a, a kind of a flowchart style. If the movie is this, give it this many points. If it's that, give it this many points. And eventually you get to, for example, has a German villain, minus three points. So this applies to the Iger Sanction, the Rookie, Million Dollar Baby. And uh, by this logic, you <laughs> have ranked today's film changeling on the very bottom of the the range called okay films with a meager eight points yep. whereas things like you know um <laughs> unforgiving gets 25 points sure. now you also rank it below firefox and the Iger sanction <laughs> which i stick up for although ian says it's bad yeah and i you, think they're you, both nonsense mostly but you rank it 13 points above Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is which uh, we are big fans of on this yeah. show. Oh, interesting. Okay, and past guest uh, Molly Lambert is a huge, huge fan of that mm -hmm. film. Uh, I think that movie has a lot of interesting things going on in it. And I also read uh, John Barrett's follow-up book, The City of Falling Angels, which is about Venice, Italy. I read mm -hmm. that. While I was over there, learned a lot about different counts. There's a lot of counts who still <laughs> sure. live in Venice and just sort of wander around saying things about it. So, um, what do you have to say for yourself? Change yep. <laughs> it's eight points there. So this is this is interesting because first of all, I actually have a lot of stuff I've probably <laughs> written for Vulture during that period, which I probably do not stand by, although oh, I should probably course. not publicly yeah. admit that. We were all because writing remember, stuff for Vulture. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, because back then I was, a, I was a desperate freelancer and very oh, often sure, of they would come to me with, hey, we figured out this thing that you should, because I've also written and I remember, and I think when I interviewed Mike Lee, it, I, I mean, I, I would not be so, so cocky as to think that he had read something I'd written, but um, I also once did something similar for Mike Lee films, like the Mike <laughs> Lee Misery Index. <laughs> Uh -huh. I like that. These are not yeah. things I'm proud of, uh, <laughs> okay. but but they are things that got me paid at a time when yeah, I needed sure. to be paid. Yeah, sure. You got to okay. get um, clicks. Yeah. And, and there were there there were yeah. So, and this was before. I mean, this was before I was a staffer and before I was involved in any meeting. So there was very little of uh, me suggesting something and then doing. Sometimes I pitch things, but anytime there was like a chart or like mathematical equations deter to determine whether a film by a great filmmaker was good or bad. Uh, it was usually like the editors at Vulture, hey, we came up with this crazy idea. We'll give you $150 if you do it for yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. Know? And of course, that's, I'm the only guy money. dumb enough to do it because I'm the I'm the guy who's seen all the movies. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. Yep. But I will say, it's like Changeling's reputation was so bad at the time. And I'd, I'd seen it, I'd liked it, but, you know, it was kind of like, oh, maybe, maybe I was just too easy on it. Like, you know, here, I'll knock it down a few points because yeah. that's what everybody wants. Um, you know, so... So, and then sort of revisiting it over the years, I'm like, no, this is actually really good. Like, this is totally like a worthwhile movie. I think he's cooking here. I think mm -hmm. we're in, we're in the midst of a, of a strong cook at this point. He's cooking. And I will say that I think you can stand by a lot of these rankings. You correctly and bravely called Absolute Power a near masterpiece, which is <laughs> yeah. terrific. I do really like Absolute movie Power. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We, we like that a lot too. Uh, so look, I think a lot. 
to feel okay about. And of course, just so we don't sully your good reputation. Yes, there's a follow-up article that just shows what a nuanced, clear thinker you are as an actual And this is also being. on your own blog, and yeah. so which proves also that uh, you know writing online film writing for click purposes maybe is not the the purest mm -hmm. uh, way to generate. We understand the great writing. That that piece, the the why Clint matters piece, and then the piece I wrote about outlaw Josie Wales. Um, those are those are the two pieces that I've always felt like I started to get at something about Clint that I found worthy of you know further study. I've always thought, oh, mm -hmm. I, I kind of want to write more about this, and of course, you rarely get opportunities to. But. Somebody give this man a book deal, please. Yep, uh, we would love. To read In about the Clint book. well, I guess books take a while to write, so it's fine. It'll come out after we're done, and uh, yeah, <laughs> only be a, serve as a compliment after we're both. Uh, we've been deep in the ground. Uh, we've had dirt piled on us yeah. by a man at uh, at sunset, uh -huh. uh, who then disappears. Some say to San Francisco. Um, I want to ask briefly about the Mike Lee Misery Index. How many points does a movie get if uh, James Corden plays a nineteen-year-old who has a heart attack in it? <laughs> Happens in another year. Uh, yeah. Very strange. Yes. Very bizarre to see James Corden <laughs> in the film. It's like that in Cats. Is he in any? Oh, and Yesterday. Are those the only movies James Corden is in? Oh no, no, he's in he's in other movies. But but um, but another year. That's also the one where um that was the that was what I actually interviewed um Mike Lee for so oh, last wow. year, the year before when when the new uh, Blu-ray of that came out. Um, but um, what's the uh, oh god, I'm blanking on her name. Sally Hawkins. Yes. Mm -hmm. The film that, you know, where the two of them, the young versions of the two of them are in, and it's kind of like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> what has yeah. he become and what has she become? This is the one where where Jim Broadbent is playing Jeremy Corbyn, uh, community garden lover, basically. This is. I, well, he's, year. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's the one, it's it's all sort of set around a like housing a, estate. Like a housing, yeah, yeah estate. Yeah. And it's the, the various people who live there. And there's one point where there's like a weird sort of. There's a man who's clearly in need of some mental health treatment who is obsessed with the Sally Hawkins character. And he's like, I guess, misinterpreting signals and uh, thinks that she is in love with him. And he, he reveals that he's carved whatever her first initial is into his chest. And her response is she's because she's got like a heavy London accent in it. She goes, don't love ya. <laughs> Which like. <laughs> I don't know really if someone good. revealed that they had just, they had mutilated themselves really to good. try to prove yeah. their love to me. I would, I don't know, I maybe use some more like pronouns and articles and stuff in my <laughs> refutation. Uh, good good movie though. Uh, yeah. I like that movie. Speaking of good movies, let's get into yeah, let's do it. talking about Changeling. Now this is, this is a movie starring Angelina Jolie. You know what? I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you off the hook for this, this Clint math thing because I think in... Uh, 2010, Bilga, you were probably very preoccupied wondering, who is Salt? Uh -huh. <laughs> you remember that? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I watched that movie on my vacation, and it was fine. It's, you know, it's not bad. Not, Got a good not, cast, I guess. Um, not, not a fan. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is just going to become a Salt podcast. It was apparently, it was written by Kurt Wimmer, or Wimmer, or whatever, the, yeah. the Equilibrium guy, and mm -hmm. it was originally set in, like, another sort of... Near future Orwellian, mm. like, dystopia, and then they were like, no, it's just DC. It's cool. going to be regular DC. Yeah, I, I was not a fan of that film, and then I, and I, I became an extra unfan of that film when uh, certain colleagues of mine started to compare it favorably to Inception. Um, wow, yeah. what a time. See? What a heady time, 2010. <laughs> the Nolan Going Wars, on the Nolan there. Wars make people say crazy, yeah. crazy things. That's, that's just, I mean, just the level of like, the, the people who worked on the movie Salt were like asleep, you know, like just on <laughs> a level of sort of mental activity. I believe my response to my review of Salt was I'd rather watch Salt. Wow. This is why he's he's Michael Mann's best friend. Folks. Uh -huh. Um so this this is a this is a movie that's written by J Michael Straczynski, the Babylon 5 guy, the the guy who wrote Wachowski collaborator. Yes, he mm -hmm. he was one of the creators of Sense8. Mm -hmm. He's uh he wrote that Thor comics run where uh Asgard is relocated to the middle of Oklahoma 
that I read that I kind of liked. And then I think people said it was bad. And so I guess I think it's bad now, too. Um, <laughs> See, this is like me and the chain. Me and chain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Were, did either of you guys watch Babylon 5, by the way? Nope. Any Babylon 5 heads? No. Any Straczynski thoughts? I've seen Sense8. Okay. It has some fine moments. Has a wonderful showcase of international actors. He's a he's a very open about being on the spectrum, mm-hmm. uh, and is it sort of seems to conduct his career in a way that is it shows that he's un unconcerned about how anyone expects him to. He's he was like a big Usenet guy. He was one of the he, he mm. apparently sort of pioneered online fan communities. Basically, before there was an online, seems like a cool guy. Anyway, in the middle of uh, his TV career, he decides he wants to write a screenplay. He had done some journalism work, and he like had a friend from the LA Times or something who said, we're about to burn a bunch of records. <laughs> uh, you should come check them out before we burn them, which seems like something they shouldn't do i don't yeah i don't know so he goes into the he goes into the records and he he sort of stumbles upon the story of christine collins who's a real woman uh one of the some of the the press material for this film argued that straczynski worked with the universal legal department to make sure that they could literally say a true story at the beginning of the film not based on a true story Mm. (laughs) apparently they they met some legal standard for uh non-based but like we're literally watching a purely true story here um so he writes this script he apparently does like collects like six thousand pieces of data and and articles and all this stuff uh he's amazed no one's ever really talked about this story because it was a huge story in 1928 i mean it Mm -hmm. was the like articles compared to the the oj trial it was like the big the big thing and then it just got forgotten he's drawn to the especially the experience of Christine Collins as a woman trying to get men to believe her. He writes a spec script, he claims in like 11 days or something, and Ron Howard and Brian Grazer immediately option it. Ron Howard wants to do it, but he's, I think he's just done the Da Vinci Code and is trying to decide what to do next and decides to make another Da Vinci Code (laughs) um, (laughs) instead. But it had become fast-tracked. I don't know how Hollywood works. Like, I don't know why you can't just slow track it again. But for mm. some reason, the movie now has to get made. And so they look for somebody who can do it quick. And the, of course, Clint Eastwood can do it <laughs> quick. And so this is the rare Malpaso film that is not with Warner Brothers. This He's back at Universal for the first time since like Iger Sanction yeah, or something. I was sort of scandalized to see. I think Iger Sanction, he yeah. had a, the big falling out. Because of, you know, it's set up at Imagine, which is set up at Universal. And Grazer also, uh, and Imagine are also the producer, or they're involved with J. Edgar, incidentally. Mm. But uh, it's a Universal picture, got that awful Blu-ray menu that all Universal releases have, where most of the menu still, it just looks like, it kind of looks like like some of the, like a, like a, a bathroom in Demolition Man. Like, it's just got this weird, like, sort of blue silver aesthetic. Mm. Anyway, they, they, all the movies have that, and it's just clips from the movie playing. Like, they don't let... Uh, I'll, I'll get off this high horse. But yeah, with the, so it's Straczynski, it's, it's Eastwood, it's Tom Stern uh, shooting it, it's Joel Cox and Gary Roach. It's all our favorite friends. Eastwood is, does the, the composition, and then he does the music. House uh, orchestrates it. I think this is Clint's best score so far. Like by a country mile. I don't know what you guys think. At least if we're going it's, chronologically, it's one of them. It's, one of them, it's, yeah. it's, it's really score. good. Yeah. And I've I've accused the the previous scores of sounding like someone's first score for a movie. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and this one feels a lot more mature. It feels like, I mean, he is granted he is sort of playing more in like the kind of music that he likes. It's it's jazzier. He talks a lot about like uh, remembering LA in the 30s. I know that um, made me laugh to read that he was saying, so funny. I remembered my childhood visiting the 1930s LA and how <laughs> taking the, the red car. Exactly. Yeah. And how people talk. And I realized, yeah, that's He's one true. of those boys who, from whom Bob Hoskins bums a cigarette in mm-hmm. Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Mm-hmm. That's yep. real. <laughs> so they shoot the movie mostly on the Universal backlot in 43 days from October to December 2007. And basically all of the Universal backlot that they shoot this on was destroyed in that fire that also claimed the King Kong part of the tram tour. And uh, basically all of the masters of the greatest music of the 20th century, like all of Billy Holiday's DECA recordings gone and Universal covered it up. 
story for a different podcast, but it's mm-hmm. very fascinating that this didn't come out for like years. Do you guys remember this? I do remember hearing about this, yeah. I remember this, yeah. Clint Eastwood should make a movie about it and, and find <laughs> uh-huh. a way to blame the government. <laughs> exactly. <true>. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would not be surprised. I believe it was started by someone who was using like a heat gun to on the roof and oh. like left it going and it caught the roof like he, I don't know, went on break or something. So I'm sure it wasn't this guy's fault. I'm sure it was like somebody was working him too hard or something and he f- forgot to use proper safety precautions. And now we're stuck with that stupid King Kong 360 3D thing <laughs> that Peter Jackson did. It's a, tra- it's a crime. It's atrocious. They also shot various parts of L.A. that have not been redeveloped because so much of um, so much of the historic parts of L.A. have been redone. So you have to go further out like San Bernardino. And- for example, her neighborhood is in San Dimas. Mm. Things like this. On the casting of Angelina Jolie, who we can get into in a, in a sec. This is from, I think, a Huffington Post interview. And they said, what is it like working with Angelina Jolie? And Clint says, it's very good. I didn't know Angelina very well before doing this. I had met her on a few occasions, but I always thought of her as a very interesting actress, a very good actress. And in recent years, of course, there's she's had so much publicity being on the cover of every possible publication in the world here, and you start taking it for granted. A lot of people get on the cover of magazines, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're talented, but in her case, she is really talented. And she's the most prepared actress, or certainly as prepared as any actress I've ever worked with. Which made me, I didn't really consider this, because I was thinking about, because this movie's about a number of things. I mean, it's, it, it gets into, obviously, police abuse, and, and the, the police is mostly a PR organization before anything else. It mm-hmm. gets into the difficulty that women have being believed by patriarchal society. And it's also about the, the horrific conditions of the, the like mental health system. And so I was thinking about, obviously, Angelina Jolie's big sort of like breakout or the the thing that the the movie that gets her taken seriously is Girl Interrupted. So I'm thinking Mm -hmm. about her like star text sort of as kind of crazy, right? Like, and she also has all these stories about whatever, the vials of Billy Bob Thornton's blood and kissing her brother. Seems to live a passionate life. Yes, that's wildly sensationalized also. And I even got so far as to try to... determine if Jay Leno had ever made a joke about how if Angelina Jolie, if one of Angelina Jolie's kids was replaced with someone else, she wouldn't notice because she has so many of them or, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that. But I didn't, I I hadn't really considered that she also has, she's been in the middle of like a media firestorm like this. And yet this is one of the first movies where I've seen her play like a regular person. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know. What do you guys, what's your, what's your Angelina Jolie take? Well, I I just, I just want a bit of clarification. So did you, did you come up with a Jay Leno joke and then retroactively go to see if he had made it? I, well, (laughs) I thought this is the obvious joke. And so I Googled like Angelina Jolie, changeling, Jay Leno, Angelina Jolie, changeling, David Letterman. Like, Uh (laughs) it seems like the obvious and like sort of callous joke to make. Because she also talks about, there's some other article where she says she almost didn't take the movie because she was too freaked out thinking about if this happened to her. Mm. But uh, yes, I, I anticipated a Jay Leno joke and tried to see if I was right. (laughs) <laughs> but uh basically the vibe of the show um i don't know what what are your what are your angelina jolie thoughts though how do we how do we feel about her i think she's really good in the film i mean she's yeah, that's why you know she's an actress who has obviously given some great performances has given some not so great performances i mean i remember um you know with uh girl interrupted you know she she won an oscar for that film uh which came out of the blue like I don't think anybody actually thought she was going to win. Maybe, maybe I, I'm misremembering, but, and this was one of those films. Cause I remember when, cause I never answered your question on sort of how I first saw the cha- for first mm. saw Changeling. Cause I remember when it came out, it, it came in for, for a bit of a drubbing. I mean, I don't remember all the reviews, but, but I remember there was a, there was a real kind of sense that because Eastwood was not really, um, perfectionist director or kind of a, a, or a technically precise uh, filmmaker that the period elements had kind of gotten out of control for him. And, you know, the, the people were unimpressed by the movie um, and, and it didn't do very well. Of course, later when Gran Torino comes out and just like sets the box office on fire, everybody was shocked. But um, right. So I, I didn't see it. In theatrical release, I actually saw it when uh, 
a, a critic for I was I was doing criticism back then, but I wasn't part of any um, uh, critics organization, so I wasn't getting end of year screeners. But a friend of mine got it, you know I had an extra screener of Changeling at the end of the year, and um, nice, and I and I took it and and I watched, and I was like, wait, this is really good. <laughs> What's going on? Um, and what I love about her performance is because she's it's a very melodramatic performance. Like it's a mm-hmm. very big performance. Uh, and I think a lot of people sort of knocked her for that. But mm-hmm. what impressed me about it was it felt like it didn't feel like a performance from a movie from the 1920s, but it felt like a, a performance or, 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 or a kind of an emotionality that would, have, that would have had currency at, at that time. Yes. You know, yeah. because, 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 you know, actors were sort of bigger back then. And, Mm. As we know, like the way that people are on screen very often reflects to the way ordinary people act. And and so it felt it felt very honest in that way. And it felt a lot more sophisticated than I think people were giving credit uh, for it. Um, also, I just find it I found it just really touching. I mean, you know, she's completely freaking out. But what's happening to her is the craziest thing that's ever happened. And yeah. at the same time. Mm-hmm the most tragic thing. I mean, yeah, because that's the thing. It's like the story is about this crazy thing that happens, which is like, right. chi- you know, she's told this kid is her child and she knows it's not. And she's told she's cra- <laughs> like, that's insane. But at the heart of it is this horrible tragedy, which is she's lost her child. Her child. Is she basically, murder. yeah, she has like no time even to grieve. Like, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. Which, which puts it in a, which puts the emotions of the film in a very kind of surreal place, like very surreal and uncomfortable. And I think the film lives up to that. I think the film has this undercurrent of tragedy with this weird sort of emotional surrealism happening as well. As you, you sort of alluded to this, there's a way that the movie is like, it's very obvious often, or people are sort of saying things out loud that you think that they shouldn't say out loud. But so much of it is based on on like documentary evidence. So a lot of it is people saying at the time, like, uh, you are a woman. Uh, I don't believe you if you contradict the police or whatever. And that's like in a, a court record. Yeah. And so there's a there's a way that it's like I was also thinking, like, if you're making a movie at the uh, in 2008, that is this hostile toward the LAPD. I feel like you have to be extremely clear and deliberate to try to get people to believe you Mm -hmm. uh to go in with you on this even the 1928 lapd yeah it it is it is funny though that 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 clint clint's a cab movie is because they're not they they don't prosecute crime more uh more fervently you know (laughs) yeah i mean well you know we've we've one of the one of the a cab sub arguments is that they don't even do the job that they're claiming to do which and the fact that I want to talk later about the actual Jim Davis, the uh, police commissioner. The Garfield guy? The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to talk a lot about Jim Davis. And then if we have time, we can get back to Changeling. Yes, that, I think that he is correctly identifying deep corruption, really explicit violence. Uh, but I agree with you, Bill. But I think it falls short maybe in recognizing that this is not like a bad apple situation that in fact the people who came before and after up to the present are you know similarly bad or at least in a continuum or something right but returning to the discussion of angela Jolie, i agree with you guys i have to be honest i was dreading watching this movie a little bit mm. because i remember seeing the promotional campaign in 2008 i think we're kind of getting into the era of Clint Eastwood movies where JQ and I were already into film, at least, you know, nascently or, you know, considering film yeah, as an art form. paying attention to the new films that were coming out that weren't just like ones with uh, Spider-Man in the middle. <laughs> yep, yeah. exactly. And even for me at the time, it sounded like it was just going to be so difficult to watch, sort of like regardless of her acting choices, right? Just kind of like you're saying, Bilbo, that it is a scenario that requires such a dramatic response that there's kind of no way to not make it Oh, yeah, it it sounds unbearable. unbearable. Yeah, exactly. But I thought that he pretty much walks the line perfectly for me, Eastwood, in terms of how much he shows. And given how much more insane the scenario is than I could have imagined, you can't (laughs) help but feel like, well, sure. Like, it feels like she deserves more space to do this. She should feel more insane, actually, than even we're seeing right now. Yeah. Yeah. I I have a, a 
final Angelina Jolie question, which is now we're not including films like Hackers and the Tomb Raider movies, which are like actually good, capital A, capital G. <laughs> but I, just in terms of thinking about movies that are genuinely good or whatever, is this the only good Angelina Jolie movie? Because for someone so famous, she doesn't really have much in the way of, like, masterpieces that she stars in. I mean, Girl Interrupted is, I think, solid. I would call that movie, like, a solid picture. But <laughs> is, this, is this the best movie she's in? Wow. Um, you guys are staring daggers at me. Yeah, I well, haven't seen A Mighty Heart, uh, which I know yeah, is, like, another... Um, I have not seen A Mighty Heart. ...big dramatic role of hers. And... A lot. You're right. I think it, it's sort of a little bit a different version of the Hilary Swank phenomenon we we're talking about, where she's been in a lot of sort of like broad audience appeal, either action or drama or comedy, and maybe doesn't get a chance to even try to act that much. I would say. I mean, you have Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Gone in sixty seconds, and what else? Uh, she plays. She plays hotties a lot, despite mm -hmm. maybe despite like. Uh, capacity to play all, all all kinds of people i mean she's very good in the good shepherd which is a good movie but she's she's not really in it for much she's a, a very much a supporting role i mean beowulf you know she sure is in it and yet is she <laughs> huh? um yeah i didn't see by the sea um i only saw the first kung fu panda but i feel like i've seen a number of the movies she's in i mean alexander is uh, an interesting film, but I wouldn't call it a masterpiece. Gone in 60 Seconds, also, you know, a good time. Bone Collector, a lot of fun. What's that, uh, the new firefighting film she's given Oh, at? yeah, Those, Those Who Wish Me, me dead. dead. Thank you. That's yeah. a very solid movie. Yep. But again, like, I, I, I wouldn't call it a masterpiece. I don't know, this, this to me, you know, not having, not having seen the upcoming uh, Pablo Lorraine Maria Callas movie that she's starring in. Oh, it's written by Stephen Knight? Whoa! Whoa! Okay, he, now I'm did, interested. Could be a masterpiece. Did, did but, he not um, write a? Did he? Did he write any of the previous Pablo Lorraine films? Did he? Did he? Oh yeah, he wrote did Spencer, he which yeah, was Spencer, which was yeah. very good. Mm. Um, so I'm excited. If we get any any even like a a, a hint of serenity, <laughs> uh, energy in the Maria <laughs> Callas movie. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Is this? But is this the the best Angelina Jolie movie? Bilga, your thoughts? Um. Well. Uh, one admission, uh, I like the tourist. Um, I was which, not which everybody pleased with it. I mean, yeah. I found it perfectly like you know, it's a confection, yeah. But yeah, then I, I, I fell asleep, it. yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I saw it after everybody decided it was like the worst movie ever and it flopped. And I went to it, you know, like a 2 p.m. matinee, and I was like, that was a perfectly enjoyable mm. film. Um, Admittedly, maybe not what you'd expect the guy who did, you know, the lives of others to to do. As yeah, his basically doing uh, like charade. Yeah, <laughs> as yeah. his follow up. Yeah, uh, yeah, but not as good. Um, yeah, right. Of course, of course. The um, I like By the Sea. I think By the Sea is a fascinating movie. I would not call it a masterpiece. It, it has issues, and I actually think she's a very good director. The uh, first they killed my father. I think is a great, great film. Uh, that, I haven't that really seen any of her. Get it to do. Yeah, um, I need to check that out. By the Sea, out. obviously, is, is also she directed. Um, you know, By the Sea has some really cringy moments, but is also really, really beautiful. Um, I don't know that any any film she's done could be called a masterpiece. Um, but that has, I mean, that is kind of been a challenge for her over the course right. of her career. And in fact, for a long for the longest time, it seemed like she wasn't really in anything that that could be called a hit. I mean, Tomb Raider, obviously, but but you know, there was this sort of sense of is she actually a movie star? You know, like she can't necessarily open a movie. I mean, there were and there were so many films where she was, you know, the girl. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, the life and nothing buts and the pushing tins and these films which are not good really at all. Um, although God knows, you know. A, like kill to have movies like those coming out today. Of course, right? yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So my kingdom for a Gia, uh -huh. you know. Well, Gia. Well, Gia was the, the, the. I mean, a lot of people knew her from Gia, uh, right? <laughs> multiple friends who had uh, well-worn VHS tapes of Gia. Um, of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember you know seeing her in Hackers and 
you know, it was just like, mm-hmm. oh my God, who is that? Wait, that's John Boyd's right. daughter, you know? Um, yep. But, uh, I mean, Change is certainly one of the better films she's been in, and I think certainly one of her best performances. Yeah. Uh, she's also, I mean, she has become increasingly, like, cool and interesting and uh, seems less and less concerned with acting, particularly. She was one of the earlier celebrities to say anything of any substance about Gaza. And that was cool to see as we were preparing for this. And she's like, you know, she, I mean, she goes to Cambodia to make the Tomb Raider movie and like ends up being a, like a UN, like some kind of, she's not an ambassador or whatever, but she was like a UN official somehow. She seems at the very least, I mean, I hate to even kind of wade into the swamp of her personal life and uh, how people talk about it, but she seems well-intentioned, which is not a, which yeah. is not carte blanche, but uh, I don't know, even compared to many actors is something I appreciate. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think she, she had cameras pointed at her when most of us have the benefit of uh, no one caring what we're doing or thinking or saying. Um, mm-hmm. And now she seems to be like a pretty fascinating adult who's doing cool stuff. Well, well, if you can imagine, I mean, being somebody, you know, in the limelight with money, with perceived power, even though mm-hmm. yeah. very often, I mean, stars don't really have power over anything other than just, you know, the movies they can get greenlit. Um, you know, you want to do something about the state of the world. Mm. Um, I mean, you, uh, you come across that a lot with, with certain actors. I, I, you know, years ago, I, I worked on a movie um, with Julia Ormond, and it was right around the time that she became kind of a spokesperson, you know, against like human trafficking. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes organizations come to these people because they're like, hey, listen, you're, you're a well known person, you're a celebrity, you're a face, you're a voice, you know help us get the word out. Sometimes it happens because they're, they themselves are just, you know, inspired or, or, or mortified by something. Um, right. But you know, it must be such a weird thing to be like a, a thoughtful, intelligent person stuck in this sort of public image cocoon where you're not allowed to be interesting or thoughtful or, or intelligent you have no space to be wrong. Yeah. Like you have, you have to, you have to carefully consider everything you say. Yeah. And, and you can, and, and there is of course the, the, um, you know, the, um, the cautionary tales of like the Richard Gears of the world where yeah. um, we'll actually not only take you less seriously, but we'll take your cause less seriously if you do it wrong, you know? Right. Um, and then, well, and there's, there's the sort of theory that he's not in movies anymore because they can't, be shown in China, right? I mean, because he's yeah, he's yeah. like the Tibet guy, yeah, yeah, uh, and she's become like the, the Cambodia, yeah, lady, despite not not being from there. Yeah, and and it becomes it also becomes this thing where you know people will you know make fun of you for these things, and people definitely make fun of oh yeah, you know, um, of Angelina Jolie and the, all the jokes about all the kids she was adopting and stuff like that, right? You know, and and then you can talk about somebody like um, Sean Penn. Right. I mean, who is, who does seem we to have. be, you, <laughs> we yeah, have, no, yeah. well, yes, obviously, uh, yeah. <laughs> Stick River, but, but also like Sean Penn is like one of these people who's like, on the one hand, you look at him and you're like, oh my God, this is a rolling calamity. Where is this going to yeah. end? And on the other hand, it's like, you know, he's like airlifting supplies to Haiti after the earthquake and, you know, going to right. Ukraine and stuff like that. And you're like, there is a world in which we read these actions completely differently. And it's entirely possible that 20, 30 years from now, we'll look back on this stuff and be like, you know, these were actually great things this person did, or maybe not, you know, or, or maybe right. it'll, it'll turn out that he was, all, you know, arms trafficking or something. Who knows? You know, <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, we got to ask uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's daughter. She's got all the secrets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it gives the, the scenes in the movie, there's so many of them where she is being flatly not believed. It gives them mm-hmm. so much more or just like she's she's dumbfounded by she, she's got a, a million cameras in her face and doesn't know what to do. And they're already taking pictures of her not knowing what to do. I mean, it does it does just lend that much more poignancy to those moments for me thinking about sort of the meta text of of Angelina Jolie herself going through this. 
we have hinted at the the plot. Well, let's let's just do a very quick <laughs> yep. run through. Because I was surprised because the movie it's got like five different kinds of movies in it. it does, so first, yeah. it's a movie about a woman, a real woman. Her name's Christine Collins. She works as a roller skating, uh, like a phone Switch switchboard operator. operator. Mm -hmm. It's extremely cool. She's roller skating around at work with like a little audio, like a microphone device on her chest that kind of looks like a like a listening trumpet or whatever but in reverse single mom she has a she's a single single mom with a son named walter he uh she wants to she tells him she's going to take him to the movies on a saturday she gets a call that uh, they're short staffed at work can she come in first of all never do this <laughs> this movie is great evidence you should yeah never give up your saturday she goes in there's some problem with like the the switch in nebraska or something so there's a lot of work to be done she gets home even later than she thought she would and walter's gone can't find him immediately her first interaction with the police is that she that they're unhelpful that they tell her like look lady he probably i don't know he's playing with a stick or something <laughs> 99 times out of 100 these kids come back we were not going to report your like nine-year-old son missing until he's gone for what is it, twenty four hours? I think so. Yeah, it's this. Yeah, he probably found a job working in a coal mine. Lady, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Cool exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's working in the the oil fields and uh, from from LA Confidential. Mm -hmm. So then she is you know uh, holding out hope. She's she's calling around. She's the only person who seems at all interested in finding her son. Uh, meanwhile, the LAPD is embroiled in various scandals. The, they have a very low public opinion. Uh, we'll get to it in a in a sec. But uh, they announce, wouldn't you know it, we found your son. And um, she goes to the train station. We've seen this boy in uh, a DeKalb, Illinois diner, just like a sort of a, a, a deleted scene from Honky Tonk Man basically shows up in the <laughs> middle of this movie. Yep. Some boy gets off the the train and she's like, that's not my son. We can tell it's not her son. And the cops are like, well, you're shocked and it's been months, so he's lost weight and, uh, <laughs> you know, take him home on a trial basis. And they manage to talk her into, like, posing with the boy and smiling, which is a real thing that happened. Like, this is a real photo. And I want to highlight without derailing that they, they do a lovely job circling back to this later as like an accusation against her right, right. everything she does is like flipped so like oh well, how would you right. accept a, a child is not yours what's wrong with you right mm -hmm. she takes him home and she like knows pretty confidently that this is not her son but she's also acknowledges that this is a child whose parents mm -hmm. are nowhere to be found so like she's got these twin responsibilities where like she knows the police are not only <laughs> derelict in their duty to look for her kid but they're also just like dumping some other kid they're not looking out for him and then we have to to connect it back to a perfect world again the second film in which a world famous movie star examines a young boy's penis on That's screen true. in a clint eastwood yep. movie mm -hmm. and and she uh says uh she's aghast notices that he's circumcised so like this couldn't be her kid and the the way the <laughs> cops turn this around and well like yeah, well, he was in the he was in the the company of a drifter. Who God knows, knows. What, <laughs> what procedures the drifter could have had done? I also <laughs> just hope the, the year... rash of circumcisions across uh -huh. the, uh, exactly. yeah. the Midwest drifters exactly. fixated on uh, the condition of his penis, and of course she also points out that he is three inches shorter than her son. Yeah, and he's also. I mean, I, I think the boy who plays Walter is the most. He's just like a a child actor. Child. Somebody He's has very... told him to act. Yeah, that was. Yeah. I wasn't sorry to see him leave the film. Really, but on. it that works to it. the film's advantage because the other kid isn't. So, like immediately, there's you can just tell that the kid is not. It's just a different boy in every way. Yeah, and but he's he's like, <laughs> hi, mommy. <laughs> like, it's terrifying. It's so uh -huh. upsetting. It's got. I mean, that the the original script was called like the the curious case of. Or the strange case of Christine Collins, but I think oh, really wow. Yes, uh, I think changing it to Changeling and invoking this this folkloric creature, where like basically mostly I think in Ireland, yeah. it's the idea that that fairies when they're old they will 
uh, sneak into people's houses and steal babies and like switch places with the babies so that uh, mothers will take care of them in their final years as a mm-hmm. fairy. And uh, mm-hmm. there, yeah, so there is something like especially uncanny about this boy. Obviously, we find out later that he just wanted to go to Hollywood to try to meet Tom Mix so that maybe he would get to ride on his horse, Tony. A nice also little connection to the maybe dangerous effect of movie star cowboys. What are they doing sure. to young yeah. boys' brains? Yeah, of course. But it's also like the, the, the boy seems so calculating and scary. and But then ultimately, you do just find out he is a boy. Like mm-hmm. he's a little boy making little boy decisions. And it's as tragic as anything else. And then she she goes to the cops and is like, that's not my son. And this is enough of an inconvenience that she is forcibly institutionalized. So now it becomes a like a mental asylum movie. Um, we have like an interlude that is is very girl interrupted or one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Shock corridor, all these these movies where someone is given ECT without uh, mm-hmm. being asked. <laughs> and uh She gets out of that, then it becomes uh, a serial killer hunt movie, then it becomes like briefly Zodiac when Michael Kelly starts tracking down sort of, and this is true also, totally unrelated to this, they just find out about the serial killer, turns out he's killing boys, Uh, one of them probably was Walter Collins, and then we have the trial section of the movie where she is at once suing the LAPD and the city of LA and also a, like a witness or attending the trial of what is his name? Gordon, Gordon Northcott. Yeah. Northcott. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's some of the reviews at the time sort of commented on the kind of uh, shifting or slippery nature of the movie. Like it kind of can't decide what it is, but I think in focusing the story on Christine, as opposed to like making a story about the Michael Kelly character or whatever, the, the cop, the Ibarra character, I think it's, allows the movie to to track the real experience of this woman and like very sensitively i think like the very first thing we the first interaction that we see between her and and a man she's she's helping one of her like co-workers deal with i I assume that there's like a like a heavy breather on a party line or something and the first so the first thing that she does is sort of hide this from her male boss. She like you euphemistically sort of uh waves him away like there was a problem with the connection. Yeah, women have secrets that men don't know about even back then. Women are are savvier and cleverer than they're given credit for from the very get go. I don't think the, I think the movie's great. That's that's my plot synopsis. Mm-hmm. Where do you, where do you guys want to go from here? Well, I think what you pinpointed is the fact that it it works because the story remains focused on her for the most part. Obviously, the, the Michael yeah. Kelly interlude and sort of trekking down the serial killer it, it sort of drifts away from her a little bit, but it's still in light of her experience. And, and all throughout, it's like she is the only sane person in the entire movie. Like, the mm. whole world has gone mad. And, I mean, even the, the Malkovich character, right? I mean, who is, you know, kind of sensitive to her and, and and sort of takes up her cause, but is also kind of a, a showboating flamboyant. I mean, the type of character that we know Clint Eastwood tends not to like. <laughs> um, but it's a right. great like 20 second scene, his introduction, right? Because right? it gets yeah. everything. It gets his political yeah. stance, his legitimacy, and also like you're saying, his his self-serving uh, right. kind yeah. of uh, cause this, this, stuff. This Reverend Gustav Briegleb was a real guy and uh, not the only radio preacher no, who he ran wasn't. afoul sure. of the LAPD and, and uh, <laughs> he was the part mayor of a team, at the time. A, a dynamic duo. A forced dyad, they call it. <laughs> Speaking of which, a very brief interlude. John Malkovich plays Reverend Gustav Briegleb. I immediately thought of, and I'm sure both of you went to exactly the same place, the character of Senator Grebleeps from Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Mm-hmm. This is the E.T. The senator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little yeah. Easter egg of an E.T. in the Senate. And also, obviously, Grebleeps is Spielberg backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, but Breegleb, Grebleeps, basically the same name. We all went there. Uh-huh. There's like four of them in the little... The little yeah, pod. Four you E.T.s he's pod, talking about. Pods? He's not talking about the movie anymore. It's okay. It's fine. Um... 
but yeah, Gre- uh, Breglev was a real guy. Yeah, he's a uh, Presbyterian preacher, I think, and he and you're talking about the other Reverend Schuler, uh, fighting Bobby, fighting Bob name? Schuler. Yep. Yeah. Um, they both, I would say, fought for legitimate causes, namely the corruption of the uh, Los Angeles city government and the LAPD specifically. And then also kind of got involved in just like general what I would associate with all like Billy Graham style uh, televangelists, which is just talking about the decay of society. Uh, yeah. they, I think the YWCA t- is holding dances that go too late in the evening. Correct. Kind of I think thing. they protested a lot of films or their groups did because of uh, right. them featuring, you know, some some amount of like upper lower thigh or something, you know. Upper lower thigh. I yep, mean, yeah. at, at this point, it would actually be full on boob, probably. Uh huh. Sure, pre, <laughs> right, this pre is code. code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom Mix's horse Tony is fully topless in this. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So you've got Bree Glib, and then you've also got this guy, yeah, fighting Bob Schuler, who was interesting podcasty for me connection. He built a radio station, KGEF, which he said stood for Keep God Ever First. <laughs> that sucks. Uh, he yeah. built that using funds donated by Lizzie Glide, who funded uh, Glide, Glide Memorial, Memorial Church oh, oh, in cool. uh, San Francisco, right. which we've talked about on the show yeah. before. Yeah. But yeah, this is a guy who's also like, because I get excited when I watch them. I'm like, oh man, they used to have like radio preachers who were mm-hmm. saying the police are corrupt. We got we can't trust the police. But then they're also like, uh, so he's you know he's he's uh, especially focused on Mayor George Cryer calling him a grafter and the chief exploiter of los angeles but then he's also like uh really racist and stuff so yep yep can't have it all folks all these people incidentally are buried at forest lawn cemetery like uh, oh, 10 really? miles from where i sit now yeah Brigleb, schuler i uh, i believe um mayor crier all these guys yeah i mean i think that we get this is a interesting transition from like you've got the kind of examination of media and publicity from the flags of our fathers and the sort of anti-authority kind of stuff that's been in a lot of Clint movies. But this, uh, as many letterbox reviewers point out, sort of anticipates Richard Jewell in a lot of ways. And Sully, of course, because Christine Collins is being, she's being railroaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, let's, let's, can we talk about forced institutionalization for a sec? Yeah, unfortunately, I uh, had not kept up. This is, I was disappointed in how timely this is. Maybe you're aware, Jake, yeah. but uh, yeah, this coincides about a month ago as we're recording this uh, with the passing of Senate Bill 43 in California, Yeah, uh, which allows basically, again, involuntary confinement, undoing uh, some acts in like 1967 that made it more Weirdly, difficult. Weirdly, stuff that was signed by Ronald Reagan yeah. that like uh, yeah, like also. establishing the, the 5150, like 72 hour hold thing, like establishing right. that limit. And now, again, these are like, yeah, these things are sort of being put back into place to basically give the cops uh, another thing to do to make homeless people go it's away. fully transparently about homeless yep. people. Newsom in his press releases is saying like, well, we, you know, we have to take real steps and respond to the reality of the homelessness problem. So, and people, people can't, they can't ask for the help that they need. So let, yeah. uh, the, the good people of, uh, the Los Angeles police department make that decision for them. Yes. I mean, same thing is happening in New York. Eric Adams, <laughs> did the said something very similar but like even uh, it wasn't as slimy as Newsom. it was more uh sort of weird and uh upsetting in in the eric adams style but the same thing is happening over there well the thing that um i, I don't know enough about this history but but i remember um seeing some stuff about it if i understand correctly you know this was the, the, the this was a sort of democratic cause at one point but what happened was you know, Reagan opened up the the, the mental institutions, but then did away yes. with any kind of social safety net that would have actually thereby basically creating the modern homelessness problem, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I want to I want to shout out two episodes of the great podcast Red Medicine, which I listened to and forgot most of because I have a a brain like uh, <laughs> sort of like a chicken coop. 
But the episode Making Mental Illness Political with Misha Fraser Carroll, who wrote a really interesting book called Mad World. And then another episode uh, with a guy named John Foote called The Radical Psychiatry of Franco Bazaglia get into this history better. But like there is this weird way that what Ronald Reagan did was technically deinstitutionalization, which is what Mm -hmm. a lot of mad activists call for. But it's it's not not like this, you know. We don't want this kind of deinstitutionalization. It, it, it really, what this guy Pizzaglia did, and this is why my going to Venice actually makes perfect sense for the podcast because he was born there. Franco Pizzaglia was this guy. He was born in Venice. He he was a, an anti-fascist, like in the Venice underground, which I don't know how they had that. It would have been very wet. But dur- in the underground during the war. And then he becomes a psychiatrist, and he's he is the guy who like totally dismantles Italy's mental institution system, but in the right way, where mm. he was he started by like you know the staff isn't going to wear uniforms anymore, so we don't have like people in white coats and people who are clearly the crazy ones, and they it was very democratic, and the whole thing was about like not using sedatives to just turn people into vegetables, but talking to people about what their problems are, what they actually need. They had like democratic processes with the the patients to to make policy changes. You know, stuff that seems like basic decency things, but was very radical in the 60s. And then this eventually led to the wholesale dismantling. Like I don't know if they tore the buildings down, but like the shutting down of the institutions, the 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 mental institution system in Italy, which is the kind of thing that I think mad activists are calling for in the in that that episode with with Misha Fraser Carroll she talks a lot about the very obvious overlap between abolition of of mental institution struggles and prison abolition struggles and often these things are the same thing well now particularly as they are the single biggest mental institution in the United States right and all you got to look at is uh how many more Black people are diagnosed with schizophrenia proportionally than white people to know that it's, you know, it's the same struggle. And even like people, activists with it who were institutionalized um, in the 60s and 70s started referring to themselves as inmates, like out mm-hmm. of solidarity with these these other movements. Yeah, I think as this film makes clear, it's not even about whether or not there are some people who may be in such a condition where they can't make the best decision for themselves or they put themselves or others in harm's way. It's, that's kind of beside the point, right? The point is that the police are using this as a bludgeon, in this case, the, you know, the Code 12 that we see to right. institutionalize and shut up any person that they deem like a danger to their dominance or just somebody who represents uh, like a, a seditious element for them in society, right? Amy Ryan's yeah. character, I think, is the Yeah, shout out to Amy example. Ryan. Yeah. This is the year after Gone Baby Gone, which mm-hmm. we talked about on our Mystic River episode. But she, Amy Ryan, is um, in every movie about a missing child. Yeah, <laughs> she has to be. Yeah, <laughs> she has to be. Uh, she gets right of first refusal or whatever. But she's great in this. And again, this is one of the 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 like blunt scenes where she really just lays it out. But also, you gotta, it's gotta be laid out. Like this woman was married to a cop who beat her, and she told somebody, and they had her locked up. You know, like. Yeah. Plain and simple. Yeah, I think that's that's what I'm saying is that the bigger issues that still exist, right? Like, obviously, housing being one that needs to probably be addressed, you know, more urgently or at least in conjunction with any other type of mental health treatment for people who are experiencing homelessness, right? And similarly, we could say, uh, I thought it was affecting even if it was kind of on the nose. There's this little exchange where Amy Ryan swears about, you know, the horses they rode in on. Uh, fuck them yeah. and the horses they rode in on. Right. And uh, Angelina Jolie's character says, well, that's not language for a lady. And I appreciated that because even as an obvious point, the idea that there's so much social extant pressure that restricts the ability of people, or I should say the women specifically or femme people to just like name the things that are happening to them. You know, it's just right. like such a fundamental part of their existence where you you have to say stuff like, how awful or uh you know that's right. that's terrible you can't even yeah. really really try to like give a sense of extremity for the horrible things that are happening around you there's a really great moment in one scene where she's talking to to jeffrey donovan as captain j jonah jameson Burn what notice. Is it? mr burt notice we didn't talk about him. yeah yeah his j. name j. is burt notice oh. <laughs> um i love jeffrey donovan by the way 
he's yeah, gonna he's be fun. back in Jay Edgar playing RFK. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's such a he's just one of those actors. That every time I see him, every time I see him in a movie, I, I'm just happy. Yeah, wonderful in Fargo season two. Yeah, yeah, he is. He apparently showed up on set deciding to do a very light Irish accent, mm-hmm. and Clint never said anything, so he just kept doing it. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, never said anything to either. But he's he's great in this. He you want to kick him in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a scene where she's trying to plead her case to him and at one point like realizes that she has to switch modes there's like a yeah i recognize this unfortunately i recognize this as a man who has interacted with women before who uh clearly realized they weren't getting through to me or something but there is like a switch that she undergoes to try to basically like feminize the way she's talking to him in the hopes that that might curry more favor and it's just like a very well observed yeah, bit of behavior and bit of acting on on Jolie's part, but yeah, I mean the the film is is very clear that the the police have this, as you said, bludgeon to like make this person go away, and there is such a just a feeling of honestly like, and I, maybe it's because I don't have children, but like I I felt even more anxious and miserable in the scenes where Christine is trying to act normal in a way that won't be turned against her than I did, you know, in the scenes where like the the kid goes missing. I mean, it's just so like stomach churning, realizing that anything you do will be used as a sign that you're insane or manipulative, you know? Yeah. You were paraphrasing this earlier, Jake, and I just want to make it clear that you weren't uh, exaggerating at all. There's the line that Clint Eastwood also quoted, I think, in some some press junkets for the film, uh, where one of the officers who sent Collins to the mental facility said, something is wrong with you. You're an independent woman. That's the whole sense. <laughs> that, right. that, like, yeah. that alone. So, yeah, I mean, it's again, yeah. it seems, uh, I don't know, ham-fisted or something, but well, this they, is what they're up against. So It's literally like signing the paper that says the police is right is indication of your sanity. And if you Mm -hmm. don't sign that, you're insane. You either think the police are right and you're sane, or you don't think that and you're insane. And like, it's not totally, I don't want to draw too many connections, but like we are recording this in a moment where it uh, is totally maddening to be alive and to see the (laughs) outright bullshit that that people are saying with a straight face about uh hamas tunnels under hospitals uh and things like this like we are in a a particularly sort of naked moment of this the insane people are the only sane people in a world gone insane or whatever yeah you're made to feel like a crazy person because you're told you can't be good if you do the thing that seems clearly good to you yeah i want to just read one one quotation from Basaglia. This is uh, translated uh, from Italian maybe into like Martian and then back. It's, it's, but, but anyway, um, he says, the mental illness is not reason and origin, but the necessary and natural consequence of the power dynamics related exclusion processes potentially and concretely acting in all social institutions. Mm. So he's basically saying like, he, and he noticed this, he tried it out and found it to be true that like when you change the sort of vibe of the place where people are confined away from this sort of mental institution, cuckoo's nest type environment, they stop acting like that. Um, yeah, yep. And it's a lot of that is a consequence of, you know, the white coats and the... It's crazy. I, I watched One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest like three days ago, and it's... it. They may have used the same props in the electroshock <laughs> uh-huh. scene. It's like the exact same little stuff. Granted, I don't know if that means that this film is anachronistic or Cuckoo's Nest is, but it's like, it's crazy. Also, shout out to Ricky Lindholm from mm, true. She's Million back. Dollar yep. Baby, <laughs> who's back. This time, cavity searching Angelina Jolie. I always think about that, like, if you're a, a, a much less famous actor playing the person who has to, whatever, like, if, if you're playing, like, um, uh, Brad Pitt's dentist, and so you're, like, putting your fingers in Brad Pitt's mouth, must be so <laughs> weird. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, he was married to Angelina Jolie. That's crazy That's, that I yeah. brought him up. It's an interesting direction to take this, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> so then we get the sort of serial killer section, um, 
And uh, the our friends over there at the IMDb Trivia were very excited to point out that the guy who calls him a serial killer. First of all, I like that he said uh, he's a serial killer, mm. uh, which sort of invoked the the newness of the phrase. But apparently, yeah. that phrase was not coined until the seventies. Yes, so, bit yeah, of famously. anachronism. Except that if he's if he's just thinking, you know, sure, the, the yeah. way he says it, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. He, he doesn't need to coin it. He just nope. it just yep. seems Killed like the thing boys to say. Serially, yes. But yeah, we got the, the, so like sort of unrelated to any of this, Michael Kelly is responding to a call from the Mounties because basically a young boy who looks like Nev Campbell has escaped from (laughs) Canada. He kind of, I I genuinely, I looked it up to see if this was not Brenton Thwaites, Mm. the the star of Gods of Egypt. Yeah. uh, Because he also looks a lot like that kid. Anyway, so he goes to pick this kid up because he needs to be sent back to Canada. And we also get some little like insight into abuse and the way the police view it i will say yeah in the initial exchange he says like well you sure looked free to me it doesn't sound like you were being held hostage i saw you you know roaming around there he also tackles this kid to the ground (laughs) so hard yeah this kid takes a like a nfl style hit Uh um from the cops and uh yeah it turns out this this kid is uh living with his uncle gordon northcott who is um, forcing him to to help murder a bunch of boys? Yeah. Now they they changed this from the real world uh, story two, a little two bit. Two significant ways. Yes. Ian, what are the ways? Well, in the real life case, there was sexual abuse involved as a major part of it. And um, you were excited to bring this up. I certainly did not say that. Uh, You're like Jake. And, Jake, let me say this. Yeah, and the other part, which I think is interesting, and I'm kind of just curious to get your guys thoughts on it as a storytelling choice they omit northcott's mother who's like a major part of the original case Mm -hmm. right she in real life protected her son maybe was an accomplice to it or at the very least when it came to the actual trial she was like constantly trying to take the blame for as much as possible she was actually the one who was tried for walter collins's murder right because she said it was her who did it so just as like another mother in the story who is going to great yeah. lengths to do something that again maybe you know is less morally defensible but is clearly like a recognition of she she kept talking about the fact that northcott had maybe been abused as a child and that they should take that into account in trying him and that you know he didn't even really do these things knowingly and i think you know i don't i don't know if as a choice for efficiency in story i understand it but uh i don't know I don't, i'm not sure if it would have added a dimension to the to the film what do you guys think i think it it could have uh, you know uh, i mean it yeah that, that sort of the symmetry or the asymmetry of, of mm-hmm. the, the the two mothers could have been interesting but i can also imagine i don't know if this was ever in a in a draft or not but i can also imagine someone like eastwood thinking Let's keep this part simple because we're already kind of straying from the main story. Yep. Because then if you do introduce that kind of symmetry, then you have to pay that off a bit more. So now suddenly right. this is like a character that you have to sort of develop a little bit at least. Um, you couldn't just sort of throw her into the mix, you know, no, it's like a plot not. device. It would actually, it, that, that would feel weird. Um, Requires explanation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love this guy. Jason Butler Harner, who plays yeah, he's terrific. Uh, I, I immediately clocked him as having a, and I hope this is okay that I'm saying this, Jason, but he has an in cold blood face. <laughs> he has the face uh-huh. of one of those guys. <laughs> he's also he's in The Good Shepherd with uh, Angie, and uh, he's also in Michael Mann's Black Hat. Mm. Uh, I don't remember him in either of those, but uh, shout out to this guy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just cleaner and having a whole family of murderers just does seem like its own movie in itself. Yeah. But we we get the sense of like, here is an actual unwell person who seems to be in a a whole different reality from the rest of us who is not being served by this institutional system either, you know? Yeah, I mean, he's he's outside. He's mm-hmm. you know, he's free. <laughs> She's yep, in the right. mental asylum. You know, he's in he's in like Wineville, which uh, after these what were called at the time the Wineville Chicken Coop murders, the town changed its name to Mira Loma. It's yeah. not Wineville anymore because uh, <laughs> uh, of how the only 
thing anyone knew about Wineville was the chicken coop murders. Yeah, I think he and Eastwood do a compelling job of showing that he is like some people in the real world who are mentally unwell and that it is not even like a case where you can, at least for me, begin to apply traditional ethics like in with throughout the trial, he was constantly changing his story, not even ways that yeah. benefited him, just like giving different accounts of the number of kids and what happened to him and uh, who did what. And we see on film that he says that he's guilty of some of them, but not Walter Collins. And then he says that he did right. do it and tortures uh, Jolie's character by calling her uh, to San Quentin so he can tell her that he didn't do it. But right. then when she gets there, he refuses to say it. Right. And then I think... For me, this is all a beautiful buildup to the true crime sequel we get here. The right. uh, little prequel sequel, yeah, yeah, meditation on on the death penalty. And I want to highlight a Le Monde article uh, that came out uh, when this was at Cannes, and somebody uh, let me get the journalist's name. This is an article by Samuel Blumenfeld. He asks Clint Eastwood straight Not up the name. I was thinking, I was going, I guessing it was going to be like. <laughs> You know, Gustav Fromage or something. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> no, not this time. Okay. Interesting. Although I will say, just as a side point, speaking of the LA Times trying to burn their articles, very difficult to dredge up this article from 2008 for some reason. From Lamont. Get your act together. Uh, so yeah. Samuel Blumenfeld asked Clint Eastwood, the serial killer. Oh, I should add, this is uh, an article in French that I Google translated to English. So if it sounds insane, it's uh, not my fault. Excited. The serial killer hanging sequence is unbearable by your attention to detail. There is no more convincing argument against the death penalty, which is what we observed mm -hmm. about true crime in the past. Although Clint Eastwood himself has said that he thinks the death penalty is defensible in some cases. Uh, his response is, if you support the death penalty, Gordon Northcott is an ideal candidate. In a perfect world, the death penalty might seem like the appropriate response to a murderer like this. At least I would like to believe so. Whether you are for or against the death penalty, you must recognize that there is something barbaric about making executions public. I understand the reasoning. You execute the culprit in front of the victim's family. Justice is thus done, and these bereaved people will find a certain inner peace. What peace are we talking about? After such a spectacle, what peace do you hope to find again? And then he talks about the realism of the neck breaking, the gesticulating of the feet. Uh, and he said, I know it's unbearable to watch, and that was the intended effect. So, I thought this was so effective, I yeah. mean, but I don't agree with Mr. Eastwood about maybe the exact point it's making. What do you guys think? Bilger, this sort of brings up a broader Eastwood question that I'd love your, sure. your take on, which is like, is he, because he'll, he'll often say things in interviews that are very blunt and reactionary and a bummer. And then the movies tell a very different story. So I wonder, do you think he is... It's the magic of Clint. <laughs> is he performing or is he is his, is his Clint the artist sort of doing things that Clint the interview subject doesn't even know about, you know? I mean, this is obviously a thing I have thought about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Clint is, Clint is a conservative. I mean, he might paint himself as a libertarian independent type, but he's a conservative. I mean, I remember when I was a, you know, when I was a little kid enthralled by Clint, I, I had this sort of picture book biography kind of thing. It wasn't a kid's mm. book, but it was one of those like, you know, back in the days when we had movie books, yeah, uh, you know, a slender volume, but with lots of pictures. And so many of them were like pictures of Clint with like Nixon buttons, you know, yeah. and mm -hmm. like campaign events and things like that, or Reagan, you know. Um, yeah. Clint's a conservative. He's always been a conservative. He fucking spoke at the, 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 the 2012 Republican yeah. National Convention and pretended we're, yeah. Barack we're Obama so was sitting in his chair. To um, Obama time, yeah. yeah excited. Um, and, and, and but it was but it's funny because and I don't know that much. I mean, I, I probably knew more about Clint's early life uh, when I was when I was younger. I haven't I haven't looked up, looked it up recently. But when he's creating when he's working as an artist it's like his best self he's such a nuanced filmmaker mm. even in a movie like gran torino or even in a movie like american sniper there's so much going on there you know he's such a thoughtful filmmaker and such a sensitive filmmaker but then there's the side of him that's you know kind of very um black and white with things um and uh but you know it was it was 
but I, I you know, I, I like the chair speech, you know, part of his whole thing about the chair speech was like railing at Obama about like the, the Iraq war, you know? Yeah. And it was kind of like, well, dude, and, and you know, I, I, I know, I know this, the standard lefty line is that Obama didn't end the Iraq war or the Afghan war and therefore he's bad, but it's kind of like, I mean, speaking as someone who was there when these wars were started by Republicans, right. um, like I'm yeah. like, no, 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 you don't get to call call the left out on that. Like, right? Th- There's plenty th- of other charges yeah, to right. make. But, Admittedly, yeah. it is a clusterfuck, and and you know, they could have they could be handling it better, but like, no, <laughs> you don't get to get up. Like, not in 2012, you don't get to get up and yeah chastise imaginary Barack Obama for the fucking Iraq war. Like that's just, uh-huh. you don't get to do that. There's yeah. something he, there's a, a piece of promo that I was reading. I guess it couldn't have been for this movie because it was after Obama had been elected, but the interviewer starts by saying like, so how are you feeling or whatever? And Clint says, well, my mortgage just went up. Yeah, I saw Clint that Eastwood, as well. You're not Huff paying Post. a fucking mortgage. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're yeah. Part like, of his yeah. weird fantasy as like a, uh, you know, yeah. put Man a pause. People, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's and you see it in a movie like Sully, you know, where they concoct this completely imaginary government boogeyman, you know, just for drama. Um, but again, you know, he is his best self when, when he's making films. And um, yeah. And, and you see that. I mean, you see that in so many films. The thing I was going to say about the... Um, the, the, the execution scene in this film, I mean, it reminded me of uh, Kieslowski's a short film about killing mm-hmm. uh, the, the execution mm-hmm. scene in that film, you know, which is obviously a, an expansion of one of the two middle episodes of the Decalogue. Um, yeah, talk what, about unbearable. Like, yeah, and that is unbearable. Just... And, and I don't know, I don't think of Clint Eastwood as a big cinephile, so I don't know if he'd seen it, but, but it did remind me of that um, right down to sort of, you know, the, the, the detail of the, the, the executed. Uh, prisoner soiling themselves and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. The feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the close-up of the feet. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, that's sort of what makes him so fascinating. Yeah. And in some ways makes his work richer. Uh, oh, yeah. Because, because you know, I, I've said that, I've written about this in the past, not so much with respect to Clint, but this idea that, um, you know, we sort of need a vibrant sort of, conservative filmmaking tradition because otherwise you know the left liberal filmmaking tradition just is is, is dog shit you know like like there needs <sighs> yeah. to be a Stag conversation uh, right i right. mean sure. one of the reasons why there was like interesting films in the 80s interesting political films in the yeah. 80s was because they were sort of hitting back against the sort of prevailing mood of sort of you know Reaganite reactionary cultural aggression Mm -hmm. law and order fear politics sure right right. right. whether it's whether it's you know popcorn stuff like rambo and the rockies or or you know something like uncommon valor you know i mean there were so many of those types of films that you know you get us you get somebody like oliver stone and he's working overtime with films like salvador or um you know and and like and then like (laughs) and then later on i mean i think oliver stone probably fried his brain in other ways but um, but later on, when sort of left liberal filmmaking and cultural products become sort of the order of the day, they're just so, you know, you, you don't get anything. You don't, you don't get anything yeah. interesting. There's no sense of, of polemic. You know, there's no, there's no nuance. There's no Adam McKay is is not really a Clint Eastwood. Well, it's like they're, a, they're, they're preaching to the choir. They're preaching to the yeah. converted. You know, it's an anodyne feeling, and they'll just say, the argument is basically like we like humans or you know we we right. believe in justice but i mean what's interesting about political filmmaking is when we get questions like well what does justice look like or you know right, how do you right. you know how does it uh, arrive for different people you know that's the questions that are only demanded like you're saying but if somebody else is saying well we also care about humans but we think to care about them you should be allowed to uh, execute people right, as right. a police officer right yeah and what's fascinating is thinking about is Clint, is it possible that Clint makes this execution sequence fully cathartically enjoying it <laughs> and then puts it out and it just happens to be the the least cathartic, least satisfying. Yeah, showing somebody ending who is like film. counting like, the steps and it, it's one of the, it, to me, it's, it rang so powerfully of like, yeah. how does society benefit from seeing this person killed? 
basically. I right. mean, one thing to protect society from somebody who's unwell, but what are we getting from this? And, yeah. and what's what's really poignant about the whole thing is, for the listener, I think I've turned a corner on saying everything is interesting, and I've started saying everything is poignant, so, uh, you know, that, I guess <laughs> that's better. That's uh, I, I'm not there yet. I'm still calling everything <laughs> interesting. <laughs> a lot of stuff is. Uh, but the film leaves us with you know, the fact that Jones and the police chief, played by, of course, the Lord Marshal of the Necromongers, Holm <laughs> Fior, haven't really talked about him, that that they were removed as a result of this this suit. Uh, the film leaves out, like in the, the final yeah. uh, cards, that they were just reinstated. Like, they just got put back in the police force. Correct. The police chief was reelected after yeah. a, another term and he was reelected as a reformer, as a guy. He came in and fired a bunch of cops and people said, this is going to be great. And right. again, I want to give Clint credit. He quoted an actual line from James Davis when he said, we're going to hold court on gunmen in the Los Angeles streets. I want them brought in dead, not alive. It's a real thing that the police chief said to the public and the Which LA Times. Like something that like harry callahan would say if yes. he ever made captain yeah you know? and that's great and i will say that i you know as somebody who's been involved in movement politics i think it's good it's important to recognize victories but it is funny just as like a clint choice to not yeah see that the this man came back uh, and actually this mayor that you mentioned earlier jake mayor crier he was bad but pretty much across the board everybody recognizes that he was followed by a mayor named Porter, who was a literal KKK member. Uh, and nice. then that man was followed by a mayor named Shaw, who's among the worst mayors in Los Angeles history. A guy who was investigated by a, a civilian committee and he sent uh, one of the police captains to car bomb the investigators. Uh, and the LA Times was, was like, party to smearing everybody involved in this investigation well but then under james davis didn't they didn't the lapd bomb the la times building this was like there was a bunch of bombs going off yeah well the la times gets bombed although i think that's also maybe uh as a reaction to like anti-communist rhetoric at the time james okay. davis also ran a in addition to his gun squad he had a red squad not to mention his monday squad <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I guess I'm the Jim Davis He's feels Garfield. the same way that Garfield okay. does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Real quick, we haven't shouted this guy out, but I want to I want to shout out James J Murakami who has been in the the Malpaso mm. gang for a long time. Uh to the supervised the production design on this film, which is obviously very impressive. He uh Murakami has a, a very long career. I believe his first film that he works on in a production design or art department capacity is Apocalypse Now. Pretty good wow. place to start. Midnight Run, Beverly Hills Cop, Unforgiven, True Romance, The Game, The Scorpion King, Changeling, Gran Torino, Invictus, Hereafter, J. Edgar, Trouble with the Curve, American Sniper, Sully, Deadwood, Ian's favorite thing to, to I do talk about. Love Deadwood. And uh just died last year at the age of ninety one. So we just have we haven't called this guy out, but he's yeah, uh yeah, all right. A Put proper some respect ledge. on his name. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I guess we we've basically covered it. Any final thoughts, fellas, on the film Changeling? <laughs> Had a lot less George C. Scott than I thought it would from the poster. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> That, that is one of my favorite films, actually, The Changeling, yeah. Peter Medak horror film. I, I love that think film, I've so. seen it, but I don't remember it. I, I want to rewatch it. See it again. It is yeah. terrifying. Okay. terrifying. And looking it up, it seems beloved. People people seem really hot on it. I, I saw it when I was uh, seven. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> um, scary. And there yeah. is actually a somewhere on a cassette somewhere in my dad's house, there is um, like a 30 minute recording of me at the age of seven in Turkish describing the movie to my mom. Oh, wow. Uh, we got it. Is there around. any chance we can get some of this? Yeah. Uh, and um, it's uh, and it's funny because at some point I, well, you haven't seen the film, so, um, or, or maybe you have, but you don't remember it, but, um, but yeah. um, it, it is about the ghost of a child uh, who was murdered and who was haunting George C. Scott's new home. 
And, and at one point during my little description of the story, I, I, I compare myself to the child, to the dead child who was killed Probably by his father. To. And my dad is like, whoa, 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 what's going on? What are you talking about? Well, how can you see yourself? And, um, yeah, uh, really and, good. You know, uh, so I had a persecution complex from a very uh-huh. young age. I wanted to ask, was your Clint book in English or in Turkish? It was in English. It was in English. Okay. I, I, um, yeah, my first Clint movies I saw in the U.S. early '80s okay. after we Got moved. It. After we moved here, I, the, the 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 music I remember from from like uh, childhood uh, from before. But um, yeah, the, the Clint the Clint book was in it. Yeah, and it's funny because like my family never throws anything away, so I don't even like that book is probably still somewhere in an attic somewhere. I'd love to find it. Yeah, if um, you ever find it, please please let us know. Yeah. So final final thoughts final. Anything we forgot to get to? Checking my notes here. This is just from one of those interviews um, where Clint says, Crimes against children are the most hideous of all. I think they would be on the top of my list of justification for capital punishment, says the 78-year-old Eastwood who has three children. Incorrect. Three? <laughs> yeah. Where are you getting your research? Uh, there's a there's a whole Wikipedia article about 20 children. how many acknowledged children he has. Yeah. Anyway, I was going to say a, a couple of them might have come after this move after this uh, interview. Um, oh yeah, Morgan Morgan's in it very briefly at the beginning. Morgan yeah. Eastwood, uh, one of the kids who hasn't seen Walter. Is he named after Morgan Freeman? Uh, we've we've speculated about that. Yeah. She is she is named oh, after. She, she. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's named after something else. I don't know. She's his Mar- kid Karen with child. Dina <laughs> Eastwood. Yeah. Uh, uh, Something like that. No, I was I was just gonna say, uh, you know, I feel bad. I've never seen this film on a big screen. Um, yeah, you know, it's um, like I said, I, I I caught it on a screener back then, and then you know, over the years, it's always been on home video and stuff. And I'd love to. It's weird. You you don't get a lot of Clint Eastwood retros. I feel like I don't know if it's because the films are studio films or, or what, but um, it and obviously like it must be mostly Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it's like you know we have to wait until. He passes away, sadly, probably, and then yeah. there'll be so some like twenty fifty eight. Yeah, we're gonna get yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I got to see Tightrope projected on a a nicely worn print, like last. I guess I was in like February, and uh, it was uh, a delight. Yeah, these he, if you can believe it, folks, Clint looks great when his head is like twenty five feet high. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and if anyone wants to do a sort of Clint's LA program with the the podcasty boys, uh, showing this and uh, every which way but loose, uh, <laughs> or uh, this movie and I mean this and this and uh, Bloodwork be a, sure, a fine yeah. double feature. Bloodwork sort of cleanse the palate a little bit. <laughs> Hit us up, American Cinematech. Yeah, there you go. Ian, final thoughts. I was just happy to see. Clint Eastwood freed of the nasty influence of Paul Haggis for me. This is, I mean, this oh, is a similar yeah. era of filmmaking, but just We've clearly off Paul Haggis, like, yeah, yeah, just like totally so scabs. excised his his part yeah. of things. Except, I will say, the final line felt like the the haunting of Paul Haggis for me when she says, "Like I have one thing I didn't have before, hope, hope." Yeah, so that that type Very of much. stuff, but it was such yeah. a minor element that I'm I'm just pleased. I'm happy with this new new stretch that yeah. we're looking looking at. Yeah. Oh, uh, wanted to mention my girlfriend, famous podcast girlfriend, pointed out that the boy when they that we didn't mention this part, but they they find a boy who escaped, and it, mm. it suggested that perhaps Walter helped him escape. The boy's name is something Clay. My girlfriend said, "Is that Sidney Sweeney's brother?" <laughs> So go back and look at this boy. He <laughs> looks so much like yeah. star of the moment, Sidney Sweeney. Uh, also, Dale Dickey plays, uh, basically wordlessly plays uh, Christine's cellmate mm-hmm. in the institution. Shout it's out true. Dale Dickey. Yeah, yeah. Great, 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 great actor. Yeah, it's yeah. Terrific character. Um, oh, and uh, one last thing. The guy who plays the doctor, Dr. Jonathan Steele, Dennis O'Hare. This is... Uh, good luck exploring the infinite abyss. Same to you from Garden State. Mm. This is the guy yeah. in the yep. trailer on the edge of the quarry who says one of the worst lines in the history of <laughs> cinema. I guess it, the line is said to him and he just says you too. Mm-hmm. But I guess that's bad. That's the worst part. Yeah. That's going to be our episode on Changeling uh, starring Angelina Jolie. Thank you so much, Bilga, 
for Thank coming you. on the show. A yeah, dream. Yeah, thanks, Belga. This was great. Well, Thank you. Uh, and we are not paying him to say that. Uh -huh. um, if folks want to read more of your excellent writing, including the blog post about why Clint Eastwood matters, uh, where can folks find all your all your stuff? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm you know, I, my full time job is at Vulture slash New York Magazine, so so that's where you go to find the new stuff, um, the good stuff. Yeah. But uh, why Clint matters and my piece about uh, outlaw Josie Wales uh, were at. Um, my my personal blog, which I haven't updated in years, uh, which I believe is at ipiri.blogspot.com. With your permission, we'll throw them all in the, the oh, that'd be great. episode yeah. notes. Yeah. They're actually yeah. like, they don't show up on Google very often. It's actually okay, kind of hard cool. to find them. So, so, yeah. We'll dig them up. Sweet. All right. Terrific. Next week, folks, we're talking about the film Gran Torino. We're going from gamer to racer. <laughs> <laughs> next week you guys remember that Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo. Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't see yeah. it should I watch it before this I mean it's not gonna we, not we before Gran Torino <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. it, but... so uh, come back to uh, to check that one out uh, remember to subscribe rate us write a review helps us on the algorithm if you like the show tell a friend tell your dad email a link to your old boss follow us on Twitter and Instagram podcast you for me if you have any comments questions or concerns or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Clint Eastwood podcast, you can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. Thank you, Ian, for being on the show. Lovely to have you. Keep crossing your fingers. Uh -huh. And thank you to Bilga, of course. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh, one more, one last thing. Uh, so Mayor Cryer mm -hmm. uh, died after hip surgery as a result of uh, he tripped on a garden hose in his backyard. So we are announcing the podcasty for me foundation, which is going to raise money <laughs> to better camouflage mayor's garden hoses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paint them the same color as the grass. So look out for that. And uh, thanks everybody for listening to the show.